guys, what's going on? Welcome to Serial at Midnight. My name is Heath, and in this video, we're going to take a look at all of the comics. <laughs> no, but really, all of the comics that have come into the Serial at Midnight headquarters in the last month to two months. Uh, we've had two conventions that we went to where we really picked up a lot of back issues, 50 cent bins, dollar bins. Uh, we'll talk about it all in this video, but there's a lot of stuff here. Trades, hardcovers. Um, so rather than try to compress this into a short, focused video, we're just going to enjoy it. We're just going to talk about these comics for as long as it takes, and really just, it is what it is. I'll try not to spend too long on each one, but uh, let's just jump right into it. The first thing I want to talk about is I grabbed this from Atlantic Comic Con. This is a Hulk Epic Collection. You guys know I'm a huge fan of the Epic Collection line. Um, the Epic Collection video that I made, where it's kind of an overview of what they are uh, a couple of years ago, is one of this channel's bigger videos. So I'm a big fan of these. Uh, this would chronologically be Volume 3. So this is 60s Incredible Hulk, written by Stan Lee. Uh, he's not by himself. This is also uh, Gary Friedrich uh, with Roy Thomas, Bill Everett, and Archie Goodwin. That's good company right there. I got this from a 4 for $20 booth. So I paid $5 for this. This is a, a uh, $40 Epic Collection. I got it for 5 bucks. So that's amazing. Um, I grabbed the Justice Society of America Celebration of 75 Years. I love these big uh, Celebration of 75 Years hardcovers that DC did a few years ago. Um, this is a collection of the Justice Society. Obviously, this came from uh, Second and Charles. You guys know I talk about Second and Charles sometimes. We live in kind of like the hub of Second and Charles. Second and Charles started in my town, so we're like ground central. Ground central? Uh, that doesn't sound right. We're, we're the central location for Second and Charles. We're like home base. So I don't know if that means anything, but I feel like sometimes we get some pretty sweet deals. Uh, this was $16 brand new, um, which is, is great. And uh, like I said, I love these the, the historical presentations. This goes back all the way to, I'm going to say uh, 1947. No, I'm sorry. 1941 is the first comic in this collection. So very awesome stuff. Um, you're going to see some more JSA in a second. Uh, oh, also from that 4 for $20 booth at Atlantic Comic Con, I grabbed the second hardcover for Mighty Avengers. Uh, I read New Avengers religiously. I have a complete set of New Avengers. The, the Bendis, it was like the rebooted Bendis after Avengers disassembled. Uh, New Avengers kind of took over and they were rebuilding the Avengers. Um, and then later into that run, after Civil War, somewhere around the Civil War, they, they spun off into Mighty Avengers, and this is the one I did not follow this. I have the first hardcover, and now I have the second hardcover. Um, but as you can see, we got Venom doing some dastardly things to Iron Man. We have Doctor Doom and Spider Woman. Um, so I'm really glad to have that. Five dollars, you guys, come on. This is really cool. I grabbed the Godzilla... King of the Monsters Essential, the Marvel Essential. This is long out of print. I can't imagine, you guys, I can't imagine this is ever going to get reprinted again. Uh, this is essentially, essentially, you see what I did there? That was just accidental. This is really a Godzilla and the larger Marvel Universe because like S.H.I.E.L.D. is trying to hunt down, like S.H.I.E.L.D. gets involved in Godzilla. It's crazy. Um, it'd be cool. Hey, there's like an anti-theft device in here which lets you know that I did not steal it. Now, where did it go? Here we go. Uh, Got to get that out. They're all, they're listening. If you're listening to this, I have the Godzilla Essential and you'll never get it back. Um, this is cool. I wish that this was color. I wish we had uh, like an epic collection for Godzilla, but that's never going to happen. With the licensing things as they are now, and look, I know Marvel is owned by, by uh, Disney now, but I can't imagine the Godzilla licensors playing nice so that, that Marvel could reprint this. But maybe it will happen. Stranger Things have happened. Um, I believe this is the complete collection of this title. So this was like $8 at Second and Charles. So uh, it's worth more than that for sure. And this is in immaculate condition. There's no remainder mark anywhere. The spine is still tight and firm. I'm a little out of breath. It's early in the morning as I'm filming this, and I'm not completely awake yet. So if I seem a little winded, that's why. It's super early. <laughs> um, the next thing is, uh, this also came from Second and Charles. This is uh, Spider-Man, the original Clone Saga. Not to be confused with the 90s Clone Saga, the Scarlet Spider, all that stuff. This is called from 
uh, Amazing Spider-Man 139 through 150, um, basically 70s comics. Um, so before the hullabaloo of the Clone Saga in the 90s, there had been groundwork laid for that a long time before. This is that complete collection. This is a, a meaty trade too. Um, kind of like an epic collection. This, you know, about 500 pages, I guess. Um, but uh, this is also out of print, though I don't know that this is going for quite the amount of money that the Godzilla volume is, but it's still kind of a, kind of a rarity. Uh, here's another celebration. Uh, this is a Teen Titans, a celebration of 50 years. Another one of those kinds of trades that, uh, that I was talking about. This is a look back at the Teen Titans. Basically, since the conception of the team here check this out you guys oh the flap's been taped down that's not good i'm gonna have to the flap has been taped to the inside of the book um but you can see early early titan stuff there this goes back to 1964 um beautiful uh reproduction the artwork is this is the slick kind of masterwork paper this is archival quality um just beautiful Beautiful comics, and of course, this goes all the way up through the Jeff John stuff, the uh, the New Fifty Two. Just an overview of uh, of the Teen Titans, so very cool as well. Um, the next two are kind of of a piece. Um, this is uh, Wonder Woman and the Justice League Volume One and Volume Two. Now, what these reprint, they still have the price tags on them too. Uh, these came from Second and Charles. What these reprint are. Justice League comics. Okay, do you guys know my, my hardcore comic book fans? You guys remember when uh, Justice League International, the Keith Giffen, James DeMatteis stuff, where Guy Gardner gets punched out by Batman with one punch? Um, that era, that Justice League International, eventually got renamed Justice League of America later into the run, and kind of they brought back the the huge heavy hitters. Wonder Woman was leading that team for a while, so that's this is essentially the, the collection of both of those. I have most of just that Justice League International slash America. I have most of that run in floppy format, but these looked really beautiful. Um, and it also collects crossover stuff like Justice League International, which was at this point in time, Justice League Europe. It had st Justice League International and Justice League Europe started roughly around the same time. Justice League International got renamed Justice League of America. And Justice League Europe got renamed Justice League International. How can anybody keep these things straight? Yet somehow I have. But this collects uh, the, so the Justice League of America issues, the Justice League Europe slash international crossover issues, and Justice League Task Force. I think I brought Look, that's very complicated for you guys. All that matters is this is... Um, I guess we're in the early 90s by this point, but this is that era of, uh, of comics. So we're still not really dealing with... Superman and Batman, Wonder Woman is really the one that they had put the spotlight on. And there's all these, the Justice League International characters, which I was a big fan of. So these were $7.97, but when I went to check out, they rang up at $3 a piece. So the second in Charles. If you guys have a second in Charles, I highly recommend you check them out. It's a very cool place. Pricing is inconsistent at second in Charles, though, because that Justice Society 75th anniversary collection. Uh, I paid sixteen dollars new for it. It's sixteen ninety seven, maybe sixteen and change. Used, it was twenty five. So go figure. They're selling new things for cheaper than they're selling their used inventory. Uh, I don't know. You have to hunt. You have to hunt at uh, Second and Charles. So um, I also got this from Second and Charles. This says that it was five dollars, but it was not. Uh, this is Robotech. I was just about dropped it. Robotech and Voltron. Two great tastes. I don't know. I haven't read this yet. I in the in the mid two thousands, the aughts, I guess there was a Robotech comic and there was a Voltron comic, and I read them both uh, from Dynamite. But I did not. I don't remember there being a crossover. And sometimes, um, how do I want to say this? Sometimes crossovers seem corporately driven, not story driven. So like. Oh, well, I got to be careful. So I'm not going to name specific names, but there's a lot of crossovers that feel like they exist only to sell toys. They don't exist because they're organically good ideas. This seems like it's probably a cool organic idea because Robotech and Voltron, both mid-80s entry points for my generation into anime. 
Um, anime was super hard to come by in the 80s, and both of these shows were pioneers. They have been adapted for American audiences, maybe the UK audience as well, I'm not sure. Um, but um, these were a, a lot of people's, these two shows introduced, I'm going to say, most kids from the 80s to anime, um, me included. So uh, it looks really cool. Like I said, I read them individually, but I haven't had a chance to read this yet. I mean, when you guys see what we've got here, you'll know why I haven't had a chance to read some of this stuff yet. Um, last of the trades. I think this is the last trade we're going to talk about. I got Superman in the Phantom Zone. And this is basically, I guess this was a mini miniseries uh, because it says that it was, um, it collects uh, Superman in the Phantom Zone, the four issue Phantom Zone miniseries, uh, including the final chapter from DC Comics Presents. So this predates my collecting days. And I'm, I'm going to be honest with you, I don't really remember this or haven't heard of this this is not something that i'm overly familiar with but these comics come from okay 1982 and 1986 so um i don't know but it's the it's the whole story so five issues roughly and this was it had a 14.99 cover price and i got it for two dollars two dollars better off dead um two dollars <laughs> So, yes, I will read that. I'm, you guys know I'm a big Superman fan. Um, I freaking cried during my review of the Death of Superman animated movie. Um, if I remember, I'll link to that right here. But uh, I love Superman. Okay, the rest of this stuff is still kind of in the bags and the hall stacks from which they originated. So, um, I'm going to start with this. This was my Magic City Comic Con haul these came from the 50 cent bin uh and there is some really cool stuff in here so let's just this oh geez this is gonna <laughs> i got a bad feeling about this okay i kind of teased this in my magic city convention uh wrap up video that i i talked about there was a i was 50 cent diving from this store and there was a Larry Hama title. Larry Hama? Larry Hama. I'm going to go with Larry Hama. I always want to say Hama. Larry Hama. I'll call him Hama in a minute. Uh, a Larry Hama series from the late 80s and early 90s that is kind of, I'm not going to say it's rare, it's kind of cult. And I've heard about it for a while, but I've never actually picked it up. It's something that um, someone somewhere wrote a rep retrospective piece about it. I saw it on Facebook or something like that. I'm, just, I'm not going to bury the lead. It's the Nth Man. The Nth. Nth Man. Nth. That sounds weird, but that's what it is. It's the Nth Man. Um, so someone, I, I read somewhere like this retrospective piece. They were talking about how underappreciated it was, how nobody, Marvel didn't know what to do with it. Listen, Larry Hammer wrote G.I. Joe. He's still writing G.I. Joe. He is most closely associated with that military comic book action. Um, and here is a book that he basically had total creative control over. It's his baby. Uh, and it ran for, I think, 16 issues, and it was done because nobody really knew what to do with it. It just kind of flew under the radar. It's this weird cult thing, and then all these years later, no one talks about it. Not a lot of people seem to remember it, um, but I got the entire 16-issue run from this back issue, uh, Ben. So, okay, I'm only seeing 15, but there should be 16 here. There we go. It was like, it was 1 through 15, like stacked r right in a row, and 16 wasn't there, and I, I just found it. I was kind of freaking out. I was like, what? Wait. So I'll just do these really quickly. So here's issue one, issue two, three, four. It's just the covers are great. So the art, um, I think, did, was the it's Ron Wagner. I think we'll see if he did the whole thing. I, see, I've only just started this. Um, I picked these up a few weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, but I've only just started to read this. Uh, and I will say that it is very, like, hardcore military. Like, you can tell that uh, Larry Hama had military... Like, he did he have military experience. He came out of the military. Uh, but whereas G.I. Joe feels kind of toned down, like he's playing by rules that have been set upon him because they're toys, right? You have to respect the properties. 
themselves. Uh, this is his baby, and so he's killing people left and right using some serious military technology and terminology, um, like the tanks and the weaponry and all of that stuff, and like getting really deep into like KGB jargon. It's it's real. It's like serious military stuff. But here's the thing: it's set in a post-apocalyptic, not post-apocalyptic, post World War Three. World War Three has happened, um, and the Inth Man is a kind of like a super guy like he's got uh powers he can manipulate uh matter he's telekinetic like all these things um and of course he's our main character he's the title character and uh look at that cover that's pretty great right um that's ron wagner so i guess ron wagner this, this is the last issue right here um ron wagner so i guess ron wagner was consistent on the whole book um very cool. Check out the, the smiley face here. Is that maybe a little nod to Watchmen? I don't know. Okay, let me put these down here. Um, and then the rest is, first of all, that was so $8 for the complete series of The Inth Man. Um, maybe one of these days there'll be like a cool special edition collection, like a hardcover. Maybe there has been, and I don't even know. Um, but um, I thought that was really, really cool. Uh, the rest of these are basically just me filling gaps. I have my comic book collection database on my phone. I get questions from time to time. What do I use to catalog the collection? Uh, there's a company called CLZ. Uh, my CLZ is the app. Um, Collectors with a Z is actually the company's name. But um, Collectors makes these apps for, well, there's desktop software. There's apps for your iPhone or for Android, I guess. Uh, and I think I paid fifteen dollars at, at, at um, a couple of years ago, and you just barcode scan in with your phone. It was a one-time fee of fifteen dollars, and then I pay an extra two dollars and fifty cents a month for cloud service, so that wherever I'm at, this is on my phone all the time. But I wanted that backup just in case of that cloud service. They've just changed things. They've updated it, and it's taken on like now there's like value ingrained into it, where like it tracks comic value and things like that and i think that now it's an additional like it's a small amount maybe a dollar fifty a month something like that but i'm grandfathered into the like i paid a one-time fee but i love it so people ask us sometimes how do you keep track of your collection i have apps uh comic book collectors is my clz comics and my clz movies um so I have my list on me at all times. I know what I have. And so when I'm running through issues and I see all new X-Men, I know that I read this on Marvel Unlimited, the app, but I don't own any of the issues. So this is the first five issues of uh, all new X-Men, which was a cool title. It was um, basically the idea behind this was Beast goes back in time to because X <laughs> From a meta perspective, it kind of seems like, boy, our current X-Men continuity is just a mess. We cannot seem to get this straight. But the original X-Men were pretty pure. So if we could only bring that original X-Men aesthetic into now, maybe we'd have something special. And so in the comics, Beast goes back in time to get the original team, you know, when, when Iceman was kind of snowball-y and soft like a snowman. Um, though I see that they've that's all resolved pretty quickly into the book. Uh, they go back, get the original X-Men, bring them to the for, to, to the to the now, uh, and try to have them <laughs> fix some things. It's it sounds kind of complicated, but it actually worked really well because the like you have Jean Grey from the '60s coming to the present and realizing that she has like what is the legacy that she has left in the time that she has missed so she is the phoenix and then there's like the school is named after her and then like she's gone she's dead um and she sacrificed herself not once but twice what does that do psychologically to you it was really interesting i'm not super into breaking down comic book characters psychologically like i know the whole um that recent DC crossover, the name of it escapes me at this moment because I'm talking about X-Men. But the whole thing where they were breaking down like the psychological traumas of some of these characters, I'm not really interested in that. I like to read comics to escape from reality, not to be reminded of it. But uh, it worked really well. But here's the problem. Shortly after this, like they just launched the thing uh, with a re you know, with number one. And then like a year into it maybe probably not even a year it was caught up in crossovers and it became an absolute mess to read it was crossing over with like guardians of the galaxy 
um, which is part of the current Marvel problem, is that you can't just grab a title and read it and enjoy it. That gets messy. And if you want to read, like this, I was reading this on the Marvel Unlimited app, and then it was like, okay, I have to go here to finish this story. Like they're in space, and I have to check this out. I'm not interested in that book. Oh, there's another crossover, and it just got so messy. So. I'll continue to collect this and put together a run, but these first five issues, like it was a strong, it was a strong run. I enjoyed it. It's kind of a shame that uh, corporate trend chasing influences these stories. Um, let's see the rest of these in this stack. Yeah, I'll just hold these up for you guys as I as I go through. These are not going to be in any particular order. They were in order, but I cataloged them, and so oh geez, I did not, I didn't do any. Uh, organizing before I showed you this. I'm filling holes in my Avengers West Coast collection. I think I'm down to about 15 issues that I need for Avengers West Coast. Um, it's Which is interesting because for a while there, Avengers West Coast, like it started strong, right? Like the whole, you have Vision and you had Scarlet Witch and uh, where's the rest of the West Coast? Okay, that was all of the West Coast. Anyway, that book started strong, and then it got really um, kind of strange. But I think that people are... I think it's got a new appreciation these days. Um, the rest of these, actually, are just regular Avengers. So I'll just show you guys these. Remember, these came out of a 50-cent bin. Uh, Avengers, what number is this? Number 215. Check out the cover. Silver Surfer. Molecule Man, we got Iron Man, Thor, Captain America, 50 cents. Um, <clears throat> number 226. This is what I was talking about this in the, the, uh, the con wrap-up video. And I was like, I was going through these boxes and this is Magic City Con. It's like, I just noticed that there were like consecutive runs, like, like really close together. So here's 226 of Avengers. Uh, 229. See, there's gaps there. They're not completely consistent, but um, close enough that you don't have to do a whole lot of work to start filling these gaps. 235, 240, 241, 245, 263, 268, 269, there's two in a row, oh, 270, 272, and then we jump to 318, 320, uh, this is all from the crossing line story, 323, um, 342, 344. Look, I don't have to just go through these one by one, but you know, when you're going through a, uh, that's very cool. I have very, I have a lot of um, 2000s Avengers, but I have very little of the original run of Avengers. I was always an X-Men kid when I first got into comics. My favorite things were Batman, Superman, the X-Men, the X family of books. I was a big X Force collector, cable, things like that. I still, I love that. I have most of a full run of X Force, mostly up until it got kind of soft rebooted by, um, was it Mike Allred who did that? I can't remember. But uh, when they brought in Dupe, <laughs> was his name Dupe? Uh, I, I jumped off on that because I really liked like the, the Rob Liefeld era stuff, which looking back now, it's kind of embarrassing, but I love that stuff. The whole Deadpool, Domino. All that stuff was really cool to me. I loved that team. Um, the Avengers Halloween special. This was another one that uh, I grabbed. So that was from that one booth. That was 50 cents. I spent $25 and I got all those comics. So if you see a box of Avengers from the late 80s or from the mid 80s into the 90s for 50 cents, I'm going to grab it. I don't know what you guys. Um, okay, so the rest of this stuff is from Atlanta Comic Con. More. Uh, gap filling, more collection filling. So I grabbed uh, X-Men, what number is this? 104. So I have the first 102 issues. I think that's right. It might be 101 of this volume of X-Men, the one that early 90s, the with Jim Lee, Chris Claremont on X-Men. It was a huge deal. One of the biggest selling comics of all time. 
uh, I have one through 101 or 102 and then it gets kind of sporadic after that because that's when I was going to college and I was like things other priorities kind of got in the way but uh, this is one that I'm filling my gap so if I had like 103 I think it is I'd have the first 104 together I could tell you specifically on my phone but that's not good that's not good YouTube let me stop and look at my database uh, okay, so here we jump back onto the Avengers West Coast. So I, I have all but about 15 issues of Avengers West Coast after that convention because of these, uh, because of this haul. And, um, you know, it was good stuff. Like, look at this. Human Torch in the Avengers. Check this one out. Right? So uh, these were the deal at this table. Let me make sure I'm telling this right. Uh, I think, yes, I got these from a guy who was, um, his booth was, um, oh, I'm not going to say, I'm going to mess it up, so I won't say it, but, uh, he was running a deal. He had a lot of like $3 bins and $5 bins. He even had a $10 bin. He had great prices, but, uh, he was doing a thing where all his bargain comics, as you know, you watch this channel, you know how I do. Uh, I'm a bargain hunter. I'm a digger. I'm a crate digger. I find the records that are cast offs and I clean them up. I find the comics that are in those, those, those cheap bins. So these came from a dollar bin, but the deal was they were one dollar each or twenty five for twenty dollars. So I was like, oh, I could put together twenty five and get them for less than a dollar each. So I did, and these came from the twenty five dollar bin. I'm sorry, the twenty five for twenty uh, haul, but. Uh, there's more too because again the order of some of this is not I don't know that I have exactly 25 here because I did go back a couple of times over the weekend and we're gonna talk about some stuff in a minute um, where on Sunday things got even cheaper that's one of my listen I'm not gonna say wait until Sunday this is the last issue of Avengers West Coast um, Avengers West Coast terminated US agent Captain America. What? Um, check out Vision. Is that, is that Scarlet Witch down there? Uh, what was I saying? Um, I'm not going to say wait until the last day of a convention because first you're depriving the vendors of profit. Um, and also if there's something that you see that you want, chances are it might not be there on that last day. But for me and for this convention... Uh, here's my Generation X collection. I have uh, a pretty, um, I, again, I can't tell you the exact number right now, but I have most of Generation X after this convention. Um, these came from a different booth. These were 50 cents each as well. Because that last day of the con, these guys were just blowing stuff out. They were like, we don't want to take all this back. So they had marked things down like half price. Um, there's some web of Spider-Man. I have uh, a good chunk of Web of Spider-Man too. It's the early years. Check this out. I got this old uh, Uncanny X-Men comic for 50 cents. Um, now it might have like <laughs> someone's name in it or something. I haven't taken it out to look at it yet, but I kind of suspect that it's just a fine or acceptable. Yeah, I see there's like a torn bit of cover on the back. So it's, I'm not into comics as a flipping you know, I don't like to buy low, sell high. I'm in it as the fan who likes to read the stories. Um, so while I do want good copies, I don't want, you know, garbage copies, but the condition is less important to me than having the unbroken runs so that I can read them um, and not have to rely on outside methods or like things that are, most of comics are not in print, right? Even when they collect things in a trader hardcover, those are only available for a certain amount of time before they go out of print again. Watchmen excluded. Watchmen will always be in print because that's DC's right, the licensing rights to Watchmen indicate, specify that if Watchmen ever goes out of print, they can't, they lose the access to those characters. So they will always keep Watchmen in print. But outside of that and like the Dark Knight Returns, you know, Things go out of print. Um, I have a huge run of Suicide Squad, too. Okay, so that was... Um, basically, that was Saturday, I believe. I believe that was maybe maybe some Sunday, too. I'm getting myself confused. I can't keep all of this straight. Too many, too many cons, too many deals. But we are closing in. This is the last... This is the last bag of comics. This is most definitely from Sunday. Uh, a couple of booths. This is not just one booth, but I went back to the guy 
that had, um, well here, I'll get to that in a minute because I know for a fact that these did not come from this guy. These, these were 50 cents. It's uh, the original Ghost Rider Rides Again. It was a seven issue miniseries and this is all seven issues. This is Johnny Blaze, you guys. When, uh, like, I think this was around the time, I want to say early 90s, 91. Yeah, so we're looking at, you know, kind of getting into that Midnight Suns, Spirits of Vengeance era, creeping up on that. Um, they brought back Johnny Blaze, and there was even a title, um, The Original Ghost Rider, I think is what it was called. But I love Johnny Blaze. You guys know I have a complete uh, Ghost Rider, that Johnny Blaze Ghost Rider collection in uh, essential form. So they're black and whites. I have none of the original, uh, I think I got dust in my eye just now. They're none of the original um, printing. I don't have any original Johnny Blaze issues, but I do have it in essential form. So it's black and white, but 50 cents for these. I got the whole series. Uh, that was That was a win. And then... I got some more Avengers West Coast, um, also from those guys. You can tell it was a different booth because they're all marked at a dollar. And then, so it was Sunday, so they were in the dollar booth or the dollar boxes. And because it was Sunday, everything was half off. I think everything pretty much across the board on Sunday was like half off. <coughs> Pardon me, because people did not want to take this stuff back with them. Um, and the booth that I told you guys about, where he had the, I'm sweating. Mm. The booth that I was telling you about where he had the 25 for 20, I came back on Sunday. There were more things there that I wanted, but I was like, ah, you know, I, I can live without it. Um, he had marked them further down so that they were 35 for 20, or you could fill a long box for like $75, something like that. Like it was like crazy cheap. So he had gotten even cheaper on these things. So I was going through the, uh, I was making my second pass through his his uh, his boxes his bargain boxes and i found this i've never read this i'm gonna be honest with you i haven't even heard of it before but it's star hunters i believe is this jerry conway no it's david michelini um star hunters it was a seven issue miniseries so we have two three four uh five uh, is six in here? Yes, and six. So seven issue miniseries. It's missing one and seven. Um, but these are nice, readable copies. Early 80s comics. I want to say this is around 82. Um, oh, no, it's 70s. 1977 and 1978. So we're getting into that Star Wars space opera era stuff. So I was talking to the guy and I was like, do you happen to have issues one or seven in any of the other any of the other boxes that you have, like a dollar or three dollars, because I'd like to have the whole set. And he was like, I, I had them because I bought these on the newsstand and I know that I had them at some point, but I don't know where they are. And he was like digging around. He was like, you know, I don't know that I can find those. I don't know that they're here, but I did. Th these characters originated in like a Marvel, uh, not a Marvel, in a uh, a, uh, a DC, DC Superstar is the name of the title. Um, he was like, so if you want the introduction of these characters, they came from this book and he pulled it out and he threw it in the stack and he's like, so let's just include that. We'll say it's a dollar. And then when I got ready to pay, I had the 35 issues. I had 36, including this one. He was like, just give me 20 bucks. So he threw this in basically for free, uh, which is very cool. So now I, with these together, this is the introduction of these characters. And then this is their series. I have two issues to go. I need number one and I need number seven. So I'm sure I can find those on mycomicshop.com or someplace like that. I'm not going to wait to find those at another show because the, the, the odds are probably pretty low, right? Like that's, there's probably not a lot of those um, out and about. So, uh, but also from that guy's booth, I got Sectars number one, which reminds me, you guys, Sectars are coming back. There's a, a company that is, um, uh, I'll, I'll put it right here, cannot... I can't off the top of my head. I can't remember Zika toys. It's Z Z I C a toys. Uh, they are doing, um, re re whatever. They're making sectars toys again. Also the Mego it's like Mego comic book action force. I, I can't remember the exact name of those either, but they're taking seventies and eighties toys and they're remaking them. And, uh, I think there's a, a Kickstarter or a, yeah, I think it was a Kickstarter for that to, to get these, but the prototypes are back in. So if you're in the sectars, um, check out Zika Toys 
for what's going on with uh, reproductions or re recreations. They're, they're, they're bringing them back. So very cool. Uh, I got this old issue of Conan. I love Conan. I saw a Conan comic from, this is number 64, you guys. This, this is this is early on. This is not like issue 210 or something like that. Um, and then the rest of this, I think, let me make sure. Yes. The rest of this is just a bunch of Thor comics for 50 cents or for, for less, 35 for 20 bucks. So I got this Thor one shot, which I've never read. This is called The Truth of history and it's written by Alan Davis with Mark Farmer on artwork. Um, I don't remember this. This is relatively recent, you know, last last five to ten years. Um, this was in the thumbnail because this I could not believe this. This was in that booth. This is Frog Thor. Now I don't know that this issue has a lot of value attached to it, but in Marvel Comics fandom, the Walt Simonson run, uh, particularly where Thor gets turned into a frog. Frog Thor is legendary. This is the stuff that like fans talk about and it's just fantastic stuff. And I, here's the thing. I have the Walter Simonson omnibus, which is like 1200 pages. Like it is a beast. It is huge. Uh, and that's the only original Thor that I have. I have, what I say original, I mean like that original run from 1960, whatever, until, 97 heroes reborn whenever the heroes return heroes reborn stuff um all of that the stanley jack kirby created thor i had none of that all, the only thing i had was collected editions of that so this is a walter simonson issue of thor with with frog thor and it was less than 50 cents and that was honestly that's one of my favorite things from the whole hall um from atlanta comic-con so mighty thor 329 uh 341, 433. Now this is where things get consistent uh, because this is when, uh, this is not Thor. I mean, it's, it's, Thor is so complicated, you guys, because there's, do we talk about Thor, the God? Do we talk about Donald Blake as Thor? Because he had an alter ego for most of the run. Like he had a human, he was a doctor it was very messy. Looking back on it, it's a wonder that Thor made it as far into Marvel Comics continuity without some adjusting as he did. But um, I this is this is the Thunderstrike Thor. So the Thor that we knew had been removed from the table, the son of Odin, Odin's son, off the table. This is a different Thor with the power of Thor. Um, and so I got so this is four thirty three, four thirty four. You can even see they've adjusted the font like it's a different font it's not the classic font that we know for thor so 434 436 437 438 439 440 so you see these are all in a row this is like the run uh 441 444, so we've skipped a little bit. 447, 448. Check that out. It's it's Thor and Spider-Man. I don't feel so good, Mr. Stark. <laughs> 449, uh, 450, which is, uh, check this out, on the other side. This is like a, a flipper, and we've got a reprint. I don't know if this is actually in here, but uh, Journey into Mystery 85. Should I open that? Nah. We're running long enough. Uh, 452. 453. 454. 455. So you see, like, I'm going through these back issue bands, and I see these runs, and I'm just like, <gasps> 456. And then 460, the return of um, Odin's son, right? So um, one of these somewhere has a special cover. Maybe it's still to come. Yes, okay. 475. Ooh, shiny. You guys, the 90s. And the 90s are totally back because gimmick covers are all their age. Let's keep the comic industry alive with gimmicks. That's exactly what the future of the industry needs. Uh, there's a little, 
a little bitter there. I don't mean to be bitter, but it's true. Um, comics are dying. You don't keep them alive by bilking the audience that you have with gimmicks. You keep them alive by bringing new people in. That's why my comic shop closed. But the comic book that I, store that I went to for free comic book day, I've been going there for the last you know years. They're out of business now. And they said it's because the comic book readership is getting older and new fans are not coming in and the, the readership just dwindles. So not a great time. Oh, here's 461. So these are a little out of order. 462. 463. And then I think the rest of these are annuals. So here's annual number nine, which I read on the trip. I read this uh, um, back, at, back, at the, back at the room. I read this and it's a really cool story. It's got Dormammu in it. It's basically Odin and Dormammu playing chess for like the the universe um and it has uh some really cool psychedelic stuff in here uh al milgram art oh it was written by chris claremont by the way i should have said that to begin with chris claremont with al milgram on art is actually pretty cool it took me like an hour to read these you guys old comics had a lot of content in them uh here's annual number 10 um, annual 15. We're definitely in the 90s now. Let me make sure. Yeah, 1990. I had to double check. What if it was like 1987? Uh, an annual 16 from 1991. And last but not least, I don't know, maybe least, annual number 17 uh, from 1993, right? 92. Um, so that is actually the hall so all of that is like the new comics that have come in so i've got so much to read let's i'm gonna be honest with you guys i'm probably not gonna read some of this stuff right now like the avengers west coast the generation x those go in to fill the gaps and then when all the gaps are full then you read so you just have to worry about reading there's no pressure to oh i gotta check this book out i gotta get this one uh, I like to build the runs and then read the runs. But I should say, I did read a lot of these books as they were coming out, and it's only now that I'm an adult, I'm looking back, and I'm like, I wish I'd collected more of that. So I'm trying to go back and pick what, pick up where I left off. But uh, what do you guys think? Like, crazy huge haul, right? I mean, it's literally well over 100 books. Um, probably closer to 200, if I had to guess. 150, something like that. It's a lot of stuff. And then if you add in the trade paperbacks and the, uh, the hardcovers... Um, I got, I got a lot of reading to do, but that's one of the great things about going to conventions and finding these deals like this is because I don't know. I don't know if the collector market is not as strong as it used to be for stuff like this or what, if it's just people trying to get, I mean, I know comic book readership is down. Comic book collecting is down people. I like I talked to people all weekend and they were like, we used to collect comics, but now we just read them digitally because they take up too much room. Um, and maybe I'll hit that point at some point myself, but for right now, the smell, the feeling of the paper in your hands, the artwork, the, the colorful artwork, in like you're there, it's there, you're there. That is how I have always read comics. Uh, and when I do something digitally, Marvel, unlimited app, it's just, there's a disconnect. Um, maybe it's necessary, I don't know. But for me, for right now, physical, you guys, I gotta collect these back issues, so. I will keep you guys posted about some of this stuff. The Nth Man, if it is as good as it continues to be, uh, I'll probably do a video about it, spotlighting it, because I think more people need to be aware of that. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we'll leave it there. This has been a long enough video. So guys, thanks for hanging out, talking all these comics and convention deals. So take care, I appreciate you very much. Uh, until next time, I will catch you later.